And uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Yannick Pings. Yannick is a, an assistant researcher here in the ESS department at UCI. He received a PhD in physics of climate at the University of Toulouse in 2010, and then he was a postdoctoral researcher at the French National Meteorological Research Center in Toulouse. He came to Irvine in 2013 as an associate project scientist and was promoted to assistant researcher in 2011. Yannick studies climate variability at seasonal to decadal scales. And uh, today he's gonna be presenting his research on regime shifts in seasonal California rainfall. Uh, so Yannick, please go ahead when you're ready to get started. Thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for joining for this seminar. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a new project uh, we have in uh, Magnus Notier Group, um, funded by the Department of Water Resources of California. And that's a project we have started last September. Uh, so it includes myself, Budron, Yuna Lim, uh, who is a postdoc who joined us uh, in January. And also we collaborate uh, with Eric Seders and Gabe Hopp from the Department of Computer Science. Um, so a quick outline of the presentation, I will briefly introduce the scientific questions and motivations uh, for the project. Then uh, in the results section, I split the results in two parts. Uh, part one is uh, about sen sensitivity experiments with the atmospheric model Wacom. Part two, is a result uh, from uh, uh, analysis of the North America Multimodal Ensemble and MME. And uh, I will finish by a conclusion and prospect. So let's jump into the scientific question and the motivation for, for this project. As you all know, California relies uh, strongly on uh, precipitation in fall and, and winter. And it's really important to store that water uh, for the next spring and summer to make sure there is enough uh, water resources for the state. Uh, so here I show a map of uh, the current reservoir conditions across the state. Uh, so we see there are several uh, reservoirs spread out across California. That's the conditions as of yesterday. Um, we are actually uh, right now at um, pretty good conditions in terms of um, uh, water storage. Uh, most of the reservoirs are close to their climatological average. But uh, I, just, I just show this um, to, uh, to uh, highlight that in California, water management is crucial. And uh, the decision makers, like the Department of uh, Water um, Resources of California, are really interested yeah, in seasonal forecast to be able to make the right decision and uh, to predict the amount of water that we, the state will need uh, across, across the year. Uh, so what is the water year? On the top plot, I show an annual cycle of daily precipitation. Uh, I'm using here the CPC Climate Prediction Center precipitation data. It's at a quarter degree over the entire US. Uh, it's uh, using uh, interpolating uh, institute data. So in black, uh, this is an example for the year 2018 of the annual cycle of daily precipitation in average over California. And in red, that's the climatological average uh, for the 1961-2020 period. So that's a solid line. And the envelope shows the 10th and 19th percentile of the uh, daily California precipitation. So on that plot, we see that most of the rain falls over California from October to April, roughly. As uh, we experienced yesterday, there is also rain falling uh, during uh, other months, especially in May. Uh, but usually we define a water year as a period going from October to, to April. So that's the definition I will use in, in that, that presentation. Um, on the bottom plot, I show a coefficient of variation of rain from one year to the other. So it's, it's simply showing the interannual variability in precipitation across the United States. 
we see that, for example, over the eastern part of the US, there is a little internal variability in precipitation. So it's less critical to be able to predict the rain months in advance. But in the southwest US, there is a high internal variability. So it means the uh, amount of rainfall that will um, happen is going to vary a lot from year to year. And that's especially the case for California. And that's a, a challenge, a big challenge for water management and uh, for people who are in charge of making decisions for water storage, water restrictions, and all kinds of water management. Um, so on that figure, I show uh, an example of uh, water year uh, for the year 1983. Uh, that's on the horizontal axis, that's time. So we are going from the beginning of the water year, October 1st, to the end of the water year, end of April. Uh, it's in millimeter per day, and that's a cumulative uh, rainfall uh, over California. It shows the uh, accumulation of rain across the season over California. Uh, the colored line shows the uh, year 1983 with different colors depending on the conditions of the um, water year. So it's dark blue if it's very wet, uh, blue if it's wet, and then we have normal dry, very dry. And then in purple, you see the dashed line shows the 1961-2020 climatological average of that cumulative rainfall. And the spread um, in shading shows the minimum and maximum um, over, over that period. So we see here that 1983 uh, was the wettest year in, in record. At, at the end of the water year, at least. And that's, that was associated with a strong El Nino in the tropical Pacific. So typically, um, when there is a strong El Nino in the tropical Pacific, we expect to get uh, more rain over California due to El Nino teleconnections that uh, spread over the extra tropics and have influences across the globe. Um, here, the next figure. I show another example of a wet year, that's 1998. Again, a strong El Nino year. Um, so El Nino historically has been the main source of predictability uh, used for seasonal forecasting of uh, California rainfall. Um, but actually that connection uh, does not always work and is intermittent and especially it had weakened in the recent decades. Uh, so uh, 2016 is a good example of that. Uh, there was a strong El Nino in the tropical Pacific, but the water here did not, did not live up to expectations. So we only received an average amount of uh, rainfall. While we were expecting an excess amount of rainfall who, that would have brought relief for the drought that California experienced from 2011 to 2017. And actually the rain came the year after. So the following year, there was no El Nino in the tropical Pacific, but that's when uh, we had a lot of rain uh, over the state. And that was the beginning of the end for the, uh, the big drought, um, uh, the big 2011-2017 uh, drought. So it, it clearly um, highlights that El Nino is not enough um, for signal forecasting. That's a driver, but um, it's, um, it's the teleconnection, especially in recent decades, uh, has not been as strong as we, we could expect. So there is a need to identify other drivers of, of uh, California rainfall at seasonal time scales. Uh, most of California rainfall uh, comes from atmospheric rivers. So uh, I show here an animation of uh, uh, one atmospheric river hitting the western US. Atmospheric rivers are those filaments of uh, moist tropical air that propagate from the tropics to the mid latitudes and bring a lot of rain when they hit the continent, and especially over the uh, western west coastline. Uh, so they, they carry a lot of uh, water vapor. And um, there has been a lot of progress in understanding atmospheric river and uh, processes associated with them. So that's the schematic at the bottom. There are different modes of climate variability. 
who are affiliated with uh, atmospheric rivers. One of them is the uh, madeleine Julian oscillation, uh, that, that is um, um, intra-seasonal oscillation in the tropics uh, that represents an eastward propagation of convection anomalies uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, tropical region with a periodicity of around 30 to 60 days. So, atmospheric um, NGO is a good source of predictability for um, the climate in the tropics, but also in the extra tropics um, at intra seasonal time scale. So, when we are trying to predict the atmospheric rivers, it depends at which time scale we are looking at. So, on that plot, I show the three time scales of interest for predicting atmospheric rivers, the weather forecast time scales up to two weeks. And that one is, of course, um, pretty good. Um, the skill, I mean, is good. Uh, then we have the sub-seasonal time scale. And that's the one um, in which we use a uh, MGO especially, but also some other sources of predictability. And there has been some good progress in, uh, at this time scale to, to predict atmospheric rivers uh, and, and, and rainfall that are associated with it. But as, at seasonal time scale uh, on the right, uh, we rely primarily on sea surface temperature and then so. And li like I've shown before, uh, that, is a, that is an intermittent teleconnection and there is really a need uh, to identify some other potential drivers of, uh, of, of seasonal variability. Um, on that plot, uh, I'm, I show that uh, there is a good skill in predicting atmospheric rivers up to three weeks. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, uh, we have the time from week one to, uh, to week three, uh, to week uh, five, sorry. And the vertical axis shows the skill in uh, predicting the occurrence of atmospheric rivers over the North Pacific Western US region. So uh, of course at week one, we have a very high skill that the weather forecast. Week two, it's pretty high. And up to week three, there is a pretty good skill. So there has been good progress at intra-seasonal time scale to, to predict atmospheric rivers. The problem beyond three weeks, there is really no skill. And uh, um, that's illustrated on that plot. Uh, so that's a skill of a seasonal forecast for precipitation uh, averaged uh, from December to February over 1995 to 2016. So those forecasts are made in mid-November and they are trying to predict the December to February average of precipitation. And that's uh, for the seasonal forecast model of NCEP, CFSV2. So we see there are some areas in the US that have good skill at seasonal time scales for precipitation, especially in the southern part and southeastern part of the, of the US. But over our region of interest, California, the skill of uh, seasonal, forecast, seasonal forecast model is still uh, very low and not better than climatology. So this is a, a big challenge for water management. And they are really interested in the department of water resources in seasonal forecast, more than in to intra-seasonal forecast, because to make the decision for uh, water storage, water restriction, things like that, they need to, to know months in advance. They, they need to have the knowledge of what uh, the water area is going to be like months in advance. So they have especially two targets of interest. In early October, they want to know how much rainfall we'll get from October to December. And then they reassess in January. And then they'd like to know what we can expect for the rest of the water year. So intra-seasonal time scales, although it's uh, very interesting, of course, for them, it's not uh, so critical. And they really want uh, to see improvement uh, in seasonal forecasting. Um, in our project, they ask us to focus specifically on a regime shift uh, in California seasonal rainfall. So um, let me explain what, what, what are those regime shift here. 
they are simply years that have a transition in the precipitation regime. So for example, the water here is gonna start to, uh, very dry. We, we get no rain. And then suddenly we, we, we receive a lot of rain that marks uh, a transition in the hydrological condition uh, over the state. So those years are particularly uh, challenging for water management because you can make decisions based on the water you have, let's say in early January, but if you get a lot of rain in February or March, then the decisions uh, you have made are not relevant anymore. So they, they, they like to, to uh, yeah, they'd like us to, to, to explore if we can gain predictability in those regime shift years. Uh, so on that plot, that's an example of a late bailout year. Um, so meaning it was uh, very dry at the beginning, 91, and then there was a lot of rain towards the end of the season. That's a well-known March miracle of 91. But there are some other years with a late bailout that uh, we, we are um, trying to understand. That, that's at the bottom here, the list of those years. And then other years of interest for that project are the opposite uh, year that are pretty wet at the beginning of the water year and then they, they, they remain dry. We don't get any rainfall for the rest of the season. So an example is 2015. In January, the state uh, of the cumulative rainfall was uh, normal. We had received a fair amount of precipitation but then there was almost no rain um, hitting the state in, in the rest of the water area. And again, on the bottom, that's a list of other uh, early strong shell of years that we are studying. So the questions uh, we are asking and the project goals are the following. Um, like I've said, seasonal forecast of California rainfall is still pretty challenging for our seasonal forecast. Uh, schemes, and especially the teleconnection with uh, ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation, has weakened. So are there other drivers that may increase predictability of water year rainfall? That's what we are trying to explore, and especially we focus on regime shift years, so those years that have the transition in the precipitation regime, and we want to find out if there are some drivers, processes that could explain them. Uh, so to be clear, we are not doing seasonal forecasting with that project. Uh, we are only investigating processes and physical mechanisms with the hope that by better understanding processes that will benefit uh, to seasonal forecasting on, on the long term. So let's go with uh, part one of results, uh, sensitivity experiments with the Wacom atmospheric mo model. So WACAM is a whole community climate atmospheric model from NCA. It's a high top atmospheric model, meaning it has a well resolved stratosphere. It has a pretty high vertical resolution, 60 vertical levels, up to 140 kilometers. We use a two degree resolution version, which is pretty coarse to study California precipitation because California is a small domain uh, and there are not a lot of grid points in the, at, at that resolution covering the, the domain. So um, I will explain it further later, but we do not focus that much on California precipitation as such. Uh, we focus on the large scale signals that are associated with uh, California precipitation. Uh, but by having a coarser resolution, that allows us to run larger ensemble of experiments. And that's what we are really interested in, to, uh, to try to limit the influence of internal variability in, in our results. So we, we've run three types of AMIP experiments over 1979, 2016. Uh, so the first one is a regular AMIP simulation with prescribed observed SSTNCIs globally. Then we have AMIP with prescribed tropical variability, it's called AMIP TROP, and AMIP with prescribed high latitude variability, AMIP HM. So let me explain what those simulations are. So the first type of simulation, the typical AMIP runs that are uh, used in a CMIP exercise, for example. So the AMIP simulation, they consist 
of, of uh, running the atmospheric model with prescribed LSST and CIs from observations. So in those simulations, there is no interactive ocean. We only force the atmospheric model with observed LSST and CIs. Um, so there, there is no feedback of the ocean in, in those simulations. And we prescribe the chronology of SST and CI that we take from ADIST in that case. So we start in 1979, we go up uh, all the way to 2016. And so the chronology of SST and CI over that period is, forced, is prescribed to the model. And we don't run only one simulation, we run an ensemble of simulation, so 10 simulation that only differ by the initial condition. We slightly perturb the temperature field um, in, in, uh, in the initial state of, of uh, this um, uh, simulation. So we get 10 different realization of the same experiment uh, with only different initial conditions. So the different simulations diverge and we get an ensemble. Then when we average this ensemble of simulations, uh, we isolate the response to the forcing in that case that the prescribed SST and CIs. And then we, we limit the effect of internal variability. Um, so those runs reveal how much California rainfall variability is driven by global SST and CIs, considering that we extract uh, the force signal from the noise with 10 ensemble members. And yeah, that may be a little low, but we, we get, I think, a good idea of, of, that, of that first response. And to be clear, they cannot be used for seasonal forecasting, of course, because we prescribe um, observed SST and CIS that were observed during the water year we are studying. So they give us a predictive skill in California rainfall that we would get if we could perfectly predict SST and CIS months in advance. But they are really useful to, to, uh, to uh, explore processes uh, associated with uh, SST and NCI variability. So that plot shows a protocol just to show that it's working. Uh, so in black, so those are time series of global SST anomalies. Um, in black, this is for observation, ADIST data from 1979 to 2016. In red, that's, that is for AMIP. So we follow closely the observation. That's what we want, that's by design. Uh, and then we have a control run that is called CSST, uh, in which uh, we prescribe cl climatological SST and CIs. So we repeat the same climato cl climatological annual cycle of SST and CIs. So there is no SST uh, internal variability. That's why the, the curve is flat. So that's a control simulation. But we can compare to to assess the effect of prescribing observed SST and CIs. So now if we look at how do we represent California rainfall variability in those runs. We get this plot. So here I show time series of California rainfall um, averaged over the water year, the entire water year from October to April. Um, so again, in black, that's for observation, in blue, that's the control, in red, that's AMIP, and I show the envelopes, because we have 10 members for the simulation, so we can show the spread. So it's a plus minus one standard deviation across the 10 ensemble members. So we see in the control, it's not surprising. We don't get any scale in uh, representing California rainfall when we have climatological SST. But when we prescribe observed SST, we get a correlation of uh, approximately 0 0.5. So there is around 25% of variance of California rainfall explained by um, uh, observed SST CIS variability. Uh, the problem, if we look closely at the graph, Actually, this skill comes from two years, especially. The year 1993 and 1998, those, those two peaks here. Yeah. And if uh, I remove those two years from the correlation, it drops to 0 0.17. So basically, the skill here is only coming from the strong linear years. And it, it, it's interesting to see that in 2016, the model went forth with SST and CTIs, um, represent or simulate an excess of rainfall that, that did, not, did not happen in observation. So again, it's, uh, uh, it suggests that uh, this 
Calif this uh, the rainfall anomaly in 2016 was not driven by ENSO and there were other processes that may explain why we didn't get the rain we were expecting from El Nino. Um, so we, we get during those El Nino years, in 83 and 98, we get a good representation of California rainfall because we get the right large scale circulation associated with El Nino. That's what I show on, the, on, on that plot. On the left, this is Z500 anomaly, so geopotential height at 500 hectopascal in NCEP. In average over October to April, that's for 1983. In the middle, we have the anomalies in the control run. So we have no signal because we don't prescribe any uh, SST variability in that case. But when we prescribe the observed SST, and it, during that year, the strong El Nino, we get the right wave trend. So we see that alternation between uh, ridging and trough anomalies in the, in the North Pacific that is typical of El Nino teleconnection. And on the right, I show the distribution of rainfall um, in the simulations versus precipitation. So uh, the blue dashed line shows the precipitation anomaly. It was uh, approximately plus two standard deviation uh, in, in 1983. Uh, so in climatological SST experiment, the control run, we don't represent any precipitation anomaly, but we get the right precipitation anomaly in our IMIP ensemble. And if I was showing 1998, that's pretty much the same result. However, in 2016, that's a different story. So like I say, there was a strong El Nino, but we didn't get the rain. And the large scale circulation looked like that. So in uh, NCEP, we see there was a trough over the North Pacific, but there was also some ridging uh, anomalies over the US that prevented atmospheric rivers and rain to, uh, to reach the Western uh, US coastline. And uh, in AMIP, actually, we don't quite get this. Uh, we get the trough that extends too much over the continent. So that explains why in AMIP in 2016, uh, we simulate an excess of rain. That's shown on the distribution here in AMIP. So uh, this red diamond, sorry, is the ensemble mean of the distribution. And this the box plot representation shows the distribution. So the uh, horizontal thick black line is the median of the distribution. Then we have the upper and lower quartile and the max and mean of the distribution. Sorry for not explaining that on the previous slide. So um, we see that California rainfall is really tied with uh, uh, the large scale circulation. So instead of focusing on California rainfall uh, index, uh, in those simulations, like I said, we have a pretty coarse resolution. So we focus on the large scale signal that is associated with uh, uh, California rainfall. So here I show a correlation between uh, California precipitation index, uh, October, April average still, and Z500 uh, from NCEP over the same season. So in contour, that is a regression, and in uh, shading, we have the correlation. So. What it says is that when we have an excess of rain over California, uh, we have a trough uh, in the eastern and North Pacific and over the western US. So if I compute the correlation between a Z500 index average over the, this domain, this rate domain, we call eastern North Pacific domain, and the precipitation index, there is a correlation of uh, minus 0 0.85. So that Pretty high correlation, and this Z500 ENP domain is a good proxy for California rainfall. So, in the following, I focus on that Z500 index. Here, I show the time series, like I've shown before for precipitation, but here it's for the Z500 in the ENP domain. Uh, so, we see that there is a pretty high correlation in the emit runs um, compared to observation of 0.69. Uh, again, it's due to those uh, strong El Nino years, 83, 98, also 2010. But uh, we see that we are still missing some of the years, and especially 2016. Uh, in, in observation, there, was, there were ridging conditions that the model that does not capture, and it captures trough conditions, like, like I've shown before. So in order to explore if there are some other tropical sources of predictability we 
that could be useful for uh, California rainfall and uh, the large scale circulation associated with it. We run uh, another type of um, another run of uh, AMIP uh, simulations called AMIP TROP. So they are similar to the previous AMIP simulations. Uh, so we still prescribe SSTNC to the model, but this time we constrain the atmosphere in the tropics uh, between 20 south and 20 north and up to 150 hectopascal across all longitudes. Uh, where we nudge um, different uh, atmospheric parameters, so T, temperature, UV, uh, horizontal winds, and surface pressure. We nudge them so that they follow the chronology, the variability observed in MERA2 reanalysis. So what we do is we take the uh, climatology, the three-hourly climatology of the model from the front, and on top of that, we superimpose anomalies, three-hourly anomalies from MIRA2 uh, using a nudging protocol that is described by this equation um, with a coefficient k that controls the strength of the nudging. So it's relaxing the model at every time step, so it matches uh, the variability from MERA2. So we are basically prescribing observations in the model, but by keeping the model mean state, so we don't have any consistency. And the coefficient of nudging we use is uh, corresponds to a five hour relaxation time scale. So there is still a little bit of freedom. So we avoid unrealistic steps in the model, but we strongly constrain it. So it follows the observed variability in the tropics. So this simulation reveals the role of the tropics in driving extratropical variability, including California rainfall. What we do when we prescribe uh, tropical variability like this, we basically prescribe the MGO. So the model does not, this model does not represent the MGO. Uh, so by nudging the, the tropics, we, we, get, we prescribe the MGO in the model. So on the top, I show an animation of MGO anomalies from NSEP, shown uh, from um, zonal wind at 850 hectopascal. We see the eight phases of the MJO, uh, and uh, we see the period is around 45 days. And as you can see, there is an eastward propagation of those anomalies, depicting the eastward propagation of the convection anomalies uh, uh, across the Indo-Pacific region. Um, on the bottom, I show power spectrum of U200 in, in that domain. Uh, in the AMIP run, on the left, we see there is no peak, no energy in the NGO uh, time window, so between roughly 30 and 60 days. But in AMIP TROP, uh, we get that peak. So it shows that we are um, really uh, prescribing the NGO in, in our simulation. Um, Another plot to show that the nudging protocol is working as it should. I show here the anomalies of the stream function at 200 hectopascal. The stream function is the integral, integral of the flow velocity. So uh, it's a rotational component of the flow. When it's uh, positive, the, the flow is uh, anticyclonic in the northern hemisphere. When it's negative, it's cyclonic, and that's the opposite in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so I, I show anomalies of the stream function at 200 hectopascal for October to April average in 2015. On the top left, that's in MERA2, uh, so that's the target we've used to constrain the model. On the bottom left, this is for any drop. So we see they really match. They, they are uh, really identical. And here I, I, I show the special pattern correlation between the two. So we effic efficiently constrain the model so it follows tropical variability, um, which is not the case in AMIP. As you can see, if you only prescribe SST to the model, you will get some of the pattern, but not everything, of course. Um, what's interesting is that by prescribing the tropics, we get a good representation of the North Pacific uh, circulation. So that's the same plot as before, but uh, over the North Pacific. Um, and we see that there was this ridging anomaly uh, in, uh, in observations that is not captured in AMIP, or is um, much way too weak. And uh, in AMIP TROP, 
uh, we, we efficiently represent um, the spatial pattern of uh, SF200. So we, we really represent the large, large scale circulation in the extra tropics by prescribing the tropical variability. And that's something that is true for every year. Uh, so here I show a time series of the pattern correlation between uh, the SF200 field in the North Pacific, in Meratu, uh, and uh, in the simulation. So the correlation between Meratu and the simulation, the domain I've shown before. And then we see that in any trop, uh, we uh, always have an, a higher correlation than in AMIP, meaning we better represent the North Pacific circulation than, than in AMIP. So um, to illustrate uh, this further, here I show the time series of uh, Z500 in the ENP domain, so that uh, Z500 uh, signal that is uh, strongly associated with precipitation. And we see that going from AMIP to AMIP TROP, we increase the correlation from 0 0.69 to 0 0.83. So uh, roughly we go from 50% of explained variance to 70% of explained variance for that uh, index in, in AMIP TROP. So that's a pretty good improvement. And what's interesting, if we look at 2016, now we are much in, a, in much better agreement with observations in, in any trough. Uh, so we, we don't get this trough anomalies anymore. We get more of a new trough or weak ridge anomalies. Um, to uh, investigate uh, the regime shift here that are particularly interesting for that project, um, I computed a regime shift index that is simply the difference between Z500 in the ENP domain uh, in winter, JFM, minus uh, fall, October, November, December. Um, so if th that index is close to zero, it means there is no shift in the um, trough ridging regime um, because you, you have basically the same uh, trough or ridge anomalies at the beginning and at the end of the wall area. But when this index um, is um, negative, strongly negative or strongly positive, it means there was a regime shift in the trough ridge uh, re regime. So if it's uh, negative, it means there is a ridge becoming a trough. And if it's positive, a trough becoming a ridge in the ENP domain. So that's a measure of uh, if a year is a regime shift year or not. Um, and what's interesting, if we plot the time series of that index uh, compared to observations, uh, we find that in AMIP, correlation is very low. Uh, AMIP doesn't capture those regime shift years. Uh, but in AMIP TROP, we get a um, pretty good correlation of 0 0.5. So we can explain roughly 25% of, of the variance in the regime shift index, which is not too bad. And that shows that really there is potential uh, in tropical sources of predictability, not only for seasonal California rainfall, but also uh, to predict a shift or to predict regime shift years. But that's of course assuming that you will have a good knowledge and a good um, prediction of the tropics. And that's a long shot, of course, but here we are trying to see which processes uh, could be important to, to improve uh, predictability in the mid-latitude. So then, briefly, um, we, we have another simulation called AMIP-HL for AMIP high latitude, in which we try to constrain um, the atmospheric variability in the Arctic. So a north of 65 degrees north and up to 300 hectopascal using the same nudging method as before. And the motivation for this is that uh, there were some, as you know, some big changes in the Arctic in, in recent decades, dramatic changes with sea ice loss and, and strong warming in the Arctic. And uh, so we wondered if 
that may have played a role in California rainfall variability and especially play a role on the 2011-2017 drought, the very long drought in California experienced. Uh, so here I show a time series of uh, D500 in the Arctic. Um, so it, it, it's really a measure of the Arctic warming because uh, when the Arctic is warming, the lower troposphere is warming, you get a rise in, uh, in the geopotential height at, at 500 hectopascal. And that's what we see in the observed time series in black. We see starting at the end of the 80s, we have a rise in the height that represents a warming of the Arctic. So that's the, what we call the Arctic amplification signal. So a strong warming in the Arctic since the end of the 80s. Uh, what's interesting, if we look at the AMIP simulation in blue, if we prescribe SST CIS, so here we prescribe CIS loss in the Arctic, it's not enough to represent uh, this Arctic amplification trend. You see that the blue line has a trend, but it's, it's not as strong. So that highlights the fact that CI loss is only one component of Arctic amplification, and there are some other components, and especially uh, moisture uh, advection from, from the mid latitudes. Uh, so in the AMIP HR simulation, when we nudge the Arctic variability, that's the green uh, curve, uh, by design, uh, we match observations very well. So what we do in that simulation, basically, is we prescribe Arctic amplification. What we found is that it, does not, it doesn't play a role on California rainfall variability. On the top, I show the time series of Z500 in the ENP domain. Um, so for AMIP, we had this correlation of 0.69 with observation, basically the same in uh, AMIP HL. So it doesn't change uh, the scale uh, in predicting that index. And that's the same for the rich, uh, regime shift index uh, on the, at, at the bottom. So that the time series of the regime shift index, we go from 0.16 correlation in to 0.25. So it seems that at least in our model, uh, Arctic amplification did not play a role in uh, California rainfall variability. Of course, that's from one model, and this kind of studies could be uh, replicated with other models, and maybe we, we would find a different result. So. Um, Quickly, I will present the second part of the, of the results. Uh, so that's mostly Yuna's work, and she's working on the North America Multimodal Ensemble, NMME. That is an experimental multimodal seasonal forecasting system that groups uh, seasonal forecast model from the US, from NOAA, GFDL, NCAR, NASA, and also from Canada. Uh, so they provide hindcast and forecast of different um, parameters over a period that goes roughly from uh, early 80s to present. And uh, they provide different uh, ensemble size for the forecast. Uh, so that's a lot of data, and not only to analyze the scale in the seasonal uh, forecast models, but also to investigate processes and try to explain uh, why the models may not have a good scale, why in some years, they have a good skill. In some years, they, they don't. I think there is a lot of potential in exploiting this data to understand physical mechanics. So uh, a quick example for a case study of 2014-15. Um, so this is a time series on the left of California precipitation. So that year was pretty wet and then became dry uh, in the second half of the season. So there was a trough in October, December, that's uh, the 200 anomalies in NCEP. Uh, this trough um, turned into a ridge in uh, January, March, uh, that blocked any storm uh, atmospheric river to reach uh, the western US coastline. And that's the precipitation anomalies at the bottom. So we see we have uh, negative precipitation anomalies, no rain during the second half of the season. And so we, we explored the NMM ensemble to see how the models did in terms of forecasting this season and especially this transition from a trough and wet conditions to, to a ridge and dry condition. So on that plot, Yuna shows uh, Z200. Uh, so a measure, it's a measure of the, of the ridge uh, in the North Pacific in October, December versus a measure of the 
reach in the January March uh, season. So what we want here is the models to be in that uh, section of the plot because uh, in observations we had negative uh, geopotential anomalies, a trough, and then we had positive geopotential anomalies, a ridge. Uh, so, so we see that only a handful of forecasts are able uh, to, to represent that, that, that shift. So then in the next slide, I compare the forecast, what we call the good forecast, the one that are in that uh, quarter of, of the plot, with the poor forecast, the forecast in, in, in that section. Uh, on the top, uh, this is the 200 anomalies in October to December. Uh, for the good forecast, the poor forecast, the number of forecast is uh, given in parentheses, and then the difference is between them. And this is for January to March, the bottom. What's striking during this year is that the poor forecast, uh, they get some sort of a zonal circulation regime throughout the water year season. While in the good forecast, there is a wave four, wave five type of pattern emerging that we also observe in, in, uh, in observations. Uh, and that's even more striking when we compute the difference between the two. So uh, this is very preliminary, but we are trying to understand what may be the cause for this uh, differences, this difference in the large scale circulation signal between good and, and poor forecast. And if we can identify drivers that may explain uh, the differences between good and poor forecast. Uh, Yuna has some uh, preliminary, preliminary results on this. And uh, she found that there is an effect of the mean state uh, of the model. So on that plot, this is a bias of uh, U200 in the North Pacific. So basically the bias of the North Pacific jet in the mid latitude in the North Pacific versus the Z200 anomalies uh, in the North Pacific. So the good models uh, should have positive anomalies because in January there was a ridge in observations. And what she finds is that the forecast and models that have a smaller bias in the North Pacific circulation have a better representation of the ridge anomaly. So they seem to do a better job in predicting the ridge uh, for that specific uh, uh, January uh, month uh, of, of 2015. So now we want to uh, explore this further and try to generalize it with more models to see if, if that result is really robust. So I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, some quick conclusions. Uh, our wall area, California rainfall and regime shift uh, in, those, uh, in this rainfall predictable. So we've seen that in Wacom, the potential predictability associated with global SST is limited to NSO years. And the AMI primes, when we prescribe global SST, do not capture regime shift in a California rainfall. However, if we nudge the tropical troposphere in the model, and especially prescribe the MJO, uh, we see that we get a better representation of the North Pacific circulation anomalies and of the regime shift years. So um, really, um, this does not mean that we can make any prediction using the nudging, but it means that if we were able to improve forecasting in the tropics, uh, that will uh, increase the scale in California rainfall, and that will be beneficial to uh, seasonal forecasting of California rainfall, especially for the regime shift years. And then uh, I've shown that despite the dramatic changes in the last decade, the Arctic variability does not seem to play a role in California rainfall, interannual, and multi-year variability in our model. Uh, future work, we want to further explore those simulations uh, to investigate mechanisms and uh, the regime shift years, uh, especially. Uh, we may run additional simulations with no QBO. So QBO is a quasi biennial oscillation. This mode of this oscillation is a stratospheric equatorial winds. That is uh, another source of uh, seasonal predictability. Uh, it, it, I didn't mention it, but it's prescribed in, a, in, in our simulations because Wacom has an option to prescribe the QBO. 
So if we remove the QBO from uh, the AMIP simulations, it may be interesting to see if it affects the results, especially because we know there is a connection between the MGO and the QBO. So that would be a way to investigate um, the MGO QBO teleconnections. We want to do more systematic analysis of uh, the North America multimodal ensemble um, to, to dig further and see if we can understand um, what differentiate good versus poor forecast uh, for the regime shift years, uh, especially. And then uh, I didn't have time to present any results on, on that component, but we are working closely with Eric and Gabe from the Department of Computer Science on the developing statistical models uh, to predict uh, California rainfall at seasonal time scales. And uh, we hope that uh, we can uh, bring some expertise in the processes to help them to uh, to, to, um, to integrate the right um, drivers in their statistical models. So that's a pretty complementary work we have with them. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Yannick. Uh, and uh, we have time for uh, questions, and especially starting with any uh, early career scientists. If you have a question, um, uh, indicate that in the uh, group chat. You can also try raising your hand, but with this many people, I think we can't see everyone at once. So any, any questions? Uh, Alex, if no one asks a question, I can have yeah, a question. Yes, yeah, please yeah. go ahead, Jenny. Yanni, thank you for this uh, very interesting study. And uh, I'm particularly interested in your first part of the print of the result, which I think you compared the Amy run with the Amy run not constrained by tropical uh, observation. Mm -hmm. And you see that the uh, simulation of California rainfall increased. Yeah. Uh, compared to, and uh, I think it, uh, that improvement seems to be particularly clear for the 2015 and 16 El Nino. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering whether or not this result uh, is uh, dependent on the WACO model you use. So if you do not use WACO model, you use the CAM, CAM AGCM instead of WACO, yeah. do you still see the similar problem or not? And the reason I'm asking this is because in our 2017 paper, we are able to simulate that near normal rainfall in 2015-16 using a similar uh, force AGCN run but with the uh, CAM mm -hmm. model, yeah. That's the reason I'm yeah. asking. So okay. I don't see any signal in the stratosphere uh, for that specific year. So I assume that if we were using CAM, we would get uh, pretty much the same response because there is no really a role of the stratosphere the benefit of having Wacom is to have a better result stratosphere. But maybe the QBO may play a role, so that could be a, a factor that if you can, you don't have the QBO. But yeah, that would be really interesting to check. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Maybe just following up on that, Yannick. So, what? Um, why are you using Wacom? What, you know, what do you expect? What benefits do you expect to get from having the um, upper atmosphere? So, like I said, there is the option to uh, have the QBO in Wacom, and we know that's a source of predictability at seasonal internal time scales. So, that's really interesting to have the QBO. I'm not sure it plays a role for that specific 2015, 16 years, but um, it's interesting for us to have it in, included in our simulation. And also for the high latitude simulation, we know that the stratosphere play a big role in a extra tropical variability in winter. So it, it's really important to have the stratosphere, uh, especially for the AMIP high latitude simulation. So there may be a stratospheric response to the forcing we impose in the troposphere. Right? Uh, yeah, Nico asked the other question yes. related, related to MJO. 
So when you constrain the Amy run with the uh, relaxation, you're including all the frequency in your uh, observation, the one you try to constrain. So you come to a conclusion that MJO in a tropical region is important to improve the simulation of California rainfall, or it's important for California rainfall. So if you repeat that experiment again, but you filter out the MJO signal, yeah. 30, 50 day in your constraint variable. So you constrain everything except the 30, 50 day band in that uh, prescribed field. Yeah. Are you able to get the similar uh, rainfall in California? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that would be really interesting. I'm not sure we could nudge the model with a filtered uh, field like this because it would be quite unrealistic. We would miss some high frequency variability in the, in the tropics. So I'm not sure how the model will react to that. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe it's possible actually because we, we are superimposing the anomalies on top of the model climatology. So we may filter the anomalies only and not the climatology. So yeah, that could be something we try. It would be really interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Yannick. I, I don't see any other questions, and so I yeah. think we'll uh, conclude and, and uh, virtually thank you uh, for, uh, for this uh, outstanding presentation. Thank Thanks, you very Yannick. much.